Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. If you say taking a life is wrong, then taking a life is wrong across the board. For him, this has been you know, uh, almost a half a century of systems failing him. You can't stop me. I'll be gone momentarily and I'll be back with a vengeance and coming back stronger. Donald Grant Young was born on December 17, 1975. He grew up in New York and lived in an area where there was nothing but crack and violence. In the 80s, crack cocaine was rampant in New York, causing an increase in different types of assault and crime altogether. Crack was cheap, and not only was it on the rise because of the affordability, but for the effect and hold it had on many people. African American communities were affected the most, especially in the inner cities. Death, addiction, and crime was not able to escape Donald, nor his family. His mother was using throughout her time carrying Donald, and as an infant, he had many health issues because of that. He did not have the best life growing up and being surrounded by addiction caused him to suffer from different mental health issues that went left untreated. Donald had siblings, but because of the chaotic home life, they were eventually left to fend for themselves and live on the streets of Brooklyn, New York. They were left to find food and shelter on their own. Finally, CPS got involved, but unfortunately for Donald and his siblings, they were all separated. Donald bounced from foster home to foster home, never having a stable place to live. Without ever truly seeing a constant positive thing in his life, Donald turned to a life of crime, something that was his normal. Fast forward to the year 2001. Donald was in a relationship with a couple of women. The first woman was Shlanda Gatewood, who was no stranger to living a life of crime. Shlanda ended up getting locked up at the Oklahoma County Jail and Donald was set on doing whatever he needed to do to get money for her bail. His second girlfriend, Cheryl Tubbs, used to work at the La Quinta Inn in Dell City. She was fired in early 2001, and Donald thought robbing Cheryl's old place of work would be exactly what he needed to do to bail Shonda out of jail. On July 18, 2001, Donald entered La Quinta Inn and asked a front desk clerk for an application and to speak with the manager. Workers believed he was inquiring about getting a new job, and while he was waiting for a manager, he made the decision to kill any witnesses to his crime. He was familiar with the layout of the building and also knew where the CCTV cameras were located. After waiting for a short while, the manager of the inn, Brenda Miguelia, started walking towards Donald. Donald noticed her and began walking towards her as well. When they were close enough to each other, Donald flashed his pistol and forced her to walk to the storage room. Once inside, he fatally shot Brenda. Donald left the storage room and then made his way to the break room where he saw employee Suzette Smith. He demanded that she leave the break room and get money out of the front register for him. She gave him money and after she completed his request, he made her walk into the manager's office. Once inside, Suzette was a strong fighter and survived three shots to the face. She continued to fight despite being hit with multiple objects like a computer monitor. Donald did whatever he could and continued trying to kill her using different methods and Suzette unfortunately succumbed to her wounds. Donald stole items from Suzette's purse and casually walked out of the hotel inn to a discount store that was nearby. On his way to the store, he ditched his gun along with some traveler's checks that were given to him by Suzette since they were in the register. Donald then called a taxi and requested to be taken to Cheryl's house. Hours later, Donald was able to use the money he made in the robbery to pay for Shlanda's $200 bond. Why do you think criminals kill witnesses over such small amounts of money? Have you noticed that the ones who don't want any witnesses end up getting caught still? Shlanda, now a free woman, was greeted by Donald when she was released from jail, and the two of them stole a car and drove it from Oklahoma City to New York City to stay with some of Donald's family. After a month on the run and killing two people over a few hundred dollars, Donald was caught, arrested in New York, and sent back to Oklahoma. Donald was charged in the Oklahoma County District Court, and he was charged with two counts of first-degree malice of forethought murder, along with two counts of robbery with firearms. The state felt that the murders were heinous enough for the death penalty. 
McDonald's trial began on November 14, 2005 and ended on November 23, 2005, with Judge Jerry Bass presiding over the case. Donald was found guilty of all charges, and he was sentenced to life in prison for the robbery charges and a death sentence for each murder count. Over the years, there were appeals, and one point on an appeal was that Donald felt he was incompetent to stand trial. From the time he was first sent to jail to await his trial up until his trial, he was examined and it was determined that he suffered from mental illnesses. Some family members testified that he was acting strange and different before the murders, and it turned out he was suffering from schizophrenia, but he was not diagnosed until after being locked up. Donald was given medication, but was not consistent with taking it, and he felt his mental health declined by the time trial started. Professional health experts and Donald's legal team felt he was competent to stand trial, and Donald felt that his lawyers did not do a good job fighting to help support his claim. The court replied by saying, The trial court's decision whether sufficient doubt exists about a defendant's ability to proceed is reviewed for an abuse of discretion. The trial court may consider the defendant's behavior, his demeanor at trial, and of course, any expert evidence on the issue. Typically, the court will rely heavily on the perceptions of defense counsel, whose job it is to consult with his client personally, explain the proceedings to him, and obtain relevant information from him about how to proceed. Closer to the time of trial, on guilt and punishment, and during the trial itself, the court had several discussions with appellant about various matters, including potential conflicts of interest and defense counsel's strategy of acknowledging guilt. Thus, the trial court not only observed appellant personally in pretrial settings, but conversed with him about matters bearing directly on his ability to understand choices in legal strategy. Our review of these exchanges shows appellant to have had a rather keen understanding of the legal process and shows he was able to make important decisions. The letter appellant addressed to the prosecutor shortly before trial, wherein he detailed his commission of the crimes, may not have been the most prudent course of action, but it does not show that he was unable to grasp the ramifications of such an admission. To the contrary, the letter indicates that appellant was fully aware of what he was doing. Similarly, Appellant's testimony in the punishment stage of trial, wherein he tried to explain his actions but expressed no remorse, may not have been beneficial to him, but it does not indicate an inability to comprehend the nature of the proceedings. Appellant's two-lawyer defense team was experienced and zealous, considering that the overwhelming evidence against their client limited their options. Appellant asked this court to disregard the lack of doubt by those who interacted with him at the time and substitute the retrospective evaluation of a different expert, Dr. McGarren, that Appellant now presents on appeal. According to the supplementary materials Appellant has presented, Dr. McGarren interviewed trial counsel and Appellant some two years after trial and reviewed, among other things, Appellant's medical records while he was in jail awaiting trial. Both trial attorneys maintained that at the time of trial, they believed Appellant understood the nature of the proceedings. Nevertheless, Dr. McGarren concludes that Appellant was unable to rationally assist them in his defense. This claim seems to be based on the fact that Appellant testified in the punishment stage against counsel's advice. This response also tied into another point on Donald's appeal, where he said he should have been able to represent himself at trial. Out of my actions, I have done uh, not thinking. I can't really explain, I can't really explain myself, because the truth be told, I really don't understand myself mentally. Then this exchange, when one board member questioned him about the planning and motivation of the killings. You chose to not leave any live witnesses, correct? Yes, sir. And that was so you wouldn't get caught? Yes, yes. And that was, a, that was the choice you made? Yes. He's afraid, and he understands that um, he may die like John Grant. I do have concerns that I'm going to be botched. It's been told to me on two different occasions that I will be botched. All of Donald's appeals were denied, and he was scheduled to be executed on Thursday, January 27th of this year, 2022. The day before his execution, on Tuesday, January 25th, Donald was denied his final clemency with a 4-1 to one vote from the Oklahoma Pardon and Parole Board. The following day, on January 26th, the U.S. Supreme Court denied an emergency stay of execution. Donald was offered to die by firing squad, but he chose to die by method of lethal injection. He was Oklahoma's first execution in the year 2022. Donald's execution also marked the first execution in the United States this year. 
Before his death, he was able to enjoy a last meal of Chinese food consisting of egg rolls, shrimp, fried rice, and sesame chicken. He also had an apple fritter and three pints of strawberry ice cream. For Donald's last words, he was given two minutes to say whatever he wanted to say before his mic was cut off. He continued to speak after his mic went off, and drugs were administered, but it was incoherent. Some of the things witnesses were able to hear Donald say was, Yo God, I got this. No medication. I didn't take nothing. Brooklyn for life. I'm solid, son. No meds, no nothing. I'm solid. I'm going to the universe and then I'll be back. God is here. The true God. I've got things to handle. No doubt. No doubt. He was executed at the Oklahoma State Pen in McAllister and his official time of death was at 10.16 a.m. There were over a dozen witnesses at Donald's execution. The memories of the murder, the trial, and the years spent waiting can be replaced with happier memories of Brenda. Memories of her laughter, her smile, her wit, her charm, and her loving heart. I, for one, am ready to remember the beauty of my sister instead of reliving the brutality of her death. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. I do have another question for you guys. If a criminal, for example, is diagnosed like Donald with schizophrenia after or during trial, do you think that they are competent to stand trial? I believe that some people with certain mental health disorders can appear to be coherent or intelligent, but I don't think that negates the fact that they actually have a disorder. Or do you feel that even if they have a disorder, they should still face the death penalty because of their crime? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below, and if you have time, check out my website, deathrowexecutions.net.